it because uh, we're not going to meet and the first problem is it hasn't advanced the slide. There we go. So tonight we've got Dr. Martin Fowler who's going to give us a, the main uh, body of the talk on exoplanet observations using the Micro Observatory Robotic Telescope Network. So that all sounds very fascinating. Um, so we're not going to have the news section um, today, but perhaps after the, um, the, the main presentation, I've, because it's been fairly clear the last few nights and a lot of uh, the members have been quite active, I've just done a few grabs from the, uh, the WhatsApp group. So I've got a few images to, to show towards the end and perhaps uh, whoever's taken them can, can speak to the images at the end. Um, so our, the upcoming events um, obviously will be virtual meetings for the foreseeable future. Uh, I think our next practical session on the 9th of April. Um, Lou Boss, if you're happy to, to do your presentation, uh, we'll do the, that part of it between say 7.30 and 8.30 and then have a short gap. And then for those that are interested in carrying on with an imaging discussion, we'll, we'll do that between nine and 10. Um, for the 23rd of April, uh, hopefully we'll have uh, Dirk Frobrish uh, with the Citizen Science Project. Um, and then in May, practical session led by Alan. Um, and moving forward to the main meeting in May, it'll be the chairman's address. So that's what we've got uh, coming up um, in the foreseeable future. Um, obviously things may change, but uh, if we pop back to tonight's main event and uh, Shane, if you could uh, give uh, Martin host privileges and we'll uh, let Martin uh, present his, his talk for the night. Okay, um, Martin. Uh oh, what is it? Uh, there we go. Unmute. It's not letting me unmute him. Martin, can you mute? Uh, I, am, I am unmuted. Okay, excellent. Yep, I need to. Okay. Um, you, nope. No, I can't share yet. Can I share my screen at some point? Bob, uh, are you still sharing by any chance? Or? No, I, it's okay. I've, I've okay. got it now. So if hopefully you should be seeing a PowerPoint come up and fingers crossed, come on, from the beginning. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, just let me try and work out how to reduce. That's okay. Um, can everybody see my, the um, the title screen? Yep. Okay. I'm, I'm assuming so. Well, okay. Thank you very much. And thank you to Alan for um, inviting me to, to speak to the, the society. Um, Whenever it was back uh, last year, I, I hadn't actually thought it was going to be virtual, but um, hey ho, we're in a different world now. Um, by way of introduction, uh, I've been uh, using the, the micro observatory for the last nine years, and I, I, I stumbled, it, stumbled upon it uh, quite accidentally through the Stargazing Live program back in 2011. Um, because I wanted some uh, astronomical images to, to, to analyze, because at the time my particular interest was, was satellite remote sensing and archeology, span which I still have. But I wanted to think about how can I use, um, is there anything I can learn from satellite imagery, uh, from uh, astronomical images, sorry. Um, so I um, discovered the micro observatory. So what I plan to do over the, over the next, uh, I think it's about 45 minutes or so, is, is to, to introduce the micro, micro observatory and then to say how uh, I've been using it to observe transits of exoplanets. Um, here's a couple of the, the, the telescopes in the foreground uh, of the the micro observatory this is out at out at mount hopkins in arizona um, you can see there are, there are two little uh, robotic telescopes connected by cables that disappear into the ground uh, into the uh, in the background is that's the the, the veritas one of the veritas uh, 
gamma ray telescopes that's also located at, at Mount Hopkins. The, um, the micro observatory is, is operated by the, um, the science education department at the um, Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics out, out in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. And, and it's a, a network of, of five robotic telescopes uh, at three locations. So we have at um, CFA Cambridge, there's two on the roof there. There's two out in uh, the Whipple Observatory out in Amado, uh, Arizona. And there's one that's being commissioned down in, uh, in Chile at the Chacharo Tololo Inter-American Observatory, CTIO. Um, these telescopes, that they're lightheartedly named after noted uh, American astronomers, uh, and more than coincident, coincidentally, they are the, uh, the first five letters of the, the alphabet. And the one that I'm really going to be talking about is, is Cecilia, which is one of these two uh, here at, at, out in, at Whipple. Um, currently, they, they, they look and collect images every night, whether it's cloudy, clear, whatever. And I estimate that they're doing about, they're taking about 100,000 images a night across the, the, the five, um, five telescopes. On the right, you can, you can see a, uh, an example of the, um, one of the, the telescopes out in, in Arizona. It's, uh, it's self-contained, it's rugged, it's waterproof, it's portable. Um, it, it's got a, a four axis mount. Um, the optics, it's a six inch uh, reflector. Uh, and it's got a clear BVRI and neutral density filter wheels. So it's, it's quite a, 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 a powerful little beast. Uh, the imaging system is, is, a, a, is, is quite old now. Uh, it's, got, it's got a CCD sensor. The FITS images that it produces at the end are 650 by 500 pixels. Um, the field of view is about is a degree by about three quarters of a degree uh, with a plate scale of five arc seconds. And uh, it can take exposures any time, anywhere between 0.05 and 60 seconds. How do you actually um, can access it? Well, there's what's known as the, the micro observatory splash page. Um, it's accessible by the link that's, that's at the bottom of the, um, of the left hand panel. Uh, if you go to that, it will come up. Um, there are two publicly accessible portals and, and two restricted access portals. Uh, I've, I've indicated the two, the public portals with, with the yellow stars. And one is the, uh, the Observing with NASA uh, website, and the other one is the DIY Planet Search. Um, I started back in 2011 using the Observing with NASA website, and, and this has got um, 39 targets that it will observe on a nightly basis, whether they are uh, visible, uh, assuming they're visible, mixtures as you can see from solar system um, objects through stars and nebulae to galaxies and beyond. Um, the, the images are acquired by the telescopes at all three locations actually, the slide's a little bit out of date here, and the important thing there, it, it provides the, the potential for multiple observations of a target per night. So you can catch it um, out in on the, uh, the East Coast uh, and, and later on the West Coast of, of, of the States. Um, there's a limited opportunity to change the observation parameters because it, it's really uh, intended for very basic use. You, you can tell it to, um, you want to do a 15 second exposure, and then it will prompt you to say, well, actually a 60 seconds is probably a better one because they're, they're actually, all of the images are, uh, that will be acquired are pre-scripted. And so there's a, a little bit of smoke and mirrors going on there. 
Um, majority of the, the images are, are unfiltered, but there are some, some color ones that are required, particularly for the nebulae. And what you do, you, you go onto the site, you, you say you want to observe, say, I don't know, the Orion Nebula, and you click observe, and uh, you, you fill in, there's a, a little, uh, little form you fill in to, to tell you to what, what parameters to use. And then press go, and the following morning, you should get a link in an email to a FITS file that you can actually download and, and look at. Um, examples of the, uh, I've got a few examples shown here. Um, so this is giving you an idea of the quality of, of the images that are required. They're not brilliant, but they are, they're, they're good. They're, I think they're quite good. So we've got the Moon, uh, the Dumbbell Nebula, the Ring Nebula, Messier 81, the Crab Nebula. And on the right hand side at the, at the bottom, what really uh, I liked about it is that, of course, these are FITS files and you can do photometry on them. And one of the first uh, targets that I looked at, I was very lucky because in 2011, Supernova 2011 DH went off and I managed to uh, follow the, uh, the progress over as we got there about 160 days, 170 days worth of, of observations. Um, it's color coded according to the different telescopes that were used throughout that time. Um, and what's it, it's yes, it shows the uh, shows a rise from invisible through to um, nearly mag 12.5 in the clear and reference to to to, to v, uh, and then that decline over time. Uh, the other interesting thing is that uh, there are actually I don't know whether you can see my pointer on the on the screen. There are um, four observations that showed a, a short peak uh, that actually preceded the main peak. And, and this uh, is the actual cooling of the, following the, the breakout of the shock wave from, from the explosion, heating up the, uh, the photosphere, and then of, of what remained of the uh, star cooling and then the rest of the, the star brightening uh, as the supernova developed. So that was quite good. I think I was quite lucky with that, getting uh, that supernova. Um, I followed it up with um, a number of uh, other observations of uh, supernovae and variable stars, uh, quite a few of which I, I've uh, written up and appear in the, uh, the journal of the British Astronomical Association. So that's the kind of the, 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 uh, the appetizer for what uh, the micro observatory can do. Now, moving on to the, the bulk of the main part of the talk, which is uh, exoplanet. Excuse me. Um, what is an exoplanet? An exoplanet or an extrasolar planet is a planet outside the solar system. So it's not a planet, it's a planet that does not orbit the sun. Um, I checked the, um, the, the, the main uh, place to find uh, about, out about exoplanets is the NASA Exoplanet Archive, which is on the right hand side. And as of the 19th of, of March, uh, there were 4,151 confirmed exoplanets that have been discovered in the past 25 years since the first exoplanet orbiting a main sequence star, 51 Peg, where it was actually uh, discovered. There's a further, um, a similar number around about just about 4,000 uh, candidates waiting to be confirmed as well. Um, Exoplanets do appear to be ubiquitous in our galaxy, and the, the chance that a random star has a planet of some form is around about one. So almost all stars have planets. Um, there's quite a diverse range of planets that have been discovered so far, and they do contrast with our uh, traditional view of what a, 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 a planetary system 
looks like based on our solar system. There are what are known as, and these were some of the first that were discovered, were the hot Jupiters. These are uh, planets the size of Jupiter and, and beyond, but are very, very close to their host star with very short orbital periods of the order of less than 10 days. Um, there are also more exotic planets, diamond worlds made entirely of carbon, super Earths, which are the interesting ones uh, with masses greater than the Earth, and ice worlds that are made of volatiles such as water, ammonia, and methane. Um, there are two main methods of observing, exo, or observing and discovering exoplanets. The first one is the radial velocity method, where you look for minor perturbations in the, in the spectra of, of the host star as, as the um, planet orbits the star and tugs on it and, and, and induces very small changes in, in, in the, the radial velocity. Uh, this is way out of the, the capability of, of uh, um, amateur astronomers at, at present, probably. I don't know, we, we might be getting there at some point. But the main uh, technique is called the transit method. And as you can probably see, hopefully see on the graph, the colored graph on the right hand side of the screen, um, the transit method, it, which is shown as all of the, the, the green bars in the, chart, in, in the chart has been responsible for the discovery of the majority of uh, exoplanets, uh, particularly using the, the, the Kepler uh, space mission. Uh, and now there's the, um, the TESS mission, which was launched uh, last year, um, and which is probably going to discover potentially 10,000. Uh, exoplanets. Um, so what is, what is the transit method? Well, it's an indirect method of observing exoplanets. It requires the, the fortuitous condition when the, the orbital plane of the planetary system is edge on to our line of sight, such that the, the exoplanet actually crosses the stellar disk of its host. And it's, it's analogous to the, uh, the transits of Mercury and Venus as seen from the Earth. And here on the right hand side is an example of the transit of Venus from uh, 2012. It was observed by the, uh, the micro observatory. Um, what happens when the planet actually passes in front of the, um, the star, there's a slight dip in brightness uh, as it uh, obscures the starlight. Um, and from that, from that dip, you can get based on the, the ratio of the, uh, the, the, the planet's radius, or the, the, you can estimate the, the planet's radius based on the, the, if you know the size of the planet, of the star, and, and the depth of, of the, um, the actual dip in the transit. And of course, the time between transit gives the, the, the period of the, uh, of the planet. Um, If you remember back to the, uh, the, the slide I showed of the, the um, microobservatory splash page, uh, one of the, um, the buttons was for DIY planet search. Uh, and this is a, a public portal that provides access to the uh, observations of transiting exoplanets by the uh, microobservatory telescope Cecilia out in Arizona. Um, it's intended as a public engagement tool for anyone to discover the transit method. It uses the same data as a, a, an online teaching resource, which is the, the Laboratory for the Study of Exoplanets, which is, which is one of those uh, uh, portals that, that isn't publicly available, but it's essentially the same. Uh, and the important thing, access to it's colloquially called DIY, is free, and all you need to do is register. So you just need to put your, your, your user, think of a, re, a username, your email address, a password, uh, and uh, it says zip code, but if you put your country in there and sign up, and, and you can start observing um, exoplanets from the comfort of your own home, phone, laptop, whatever. Um, 
it's quite a um, challenge to observe exoplanets with, with, with a small telescope um, because, because of the, the size of a planet compared with the, uh, the size of, uh, of a star, uh, for something like a, a hot Jupiter, which is um, maybe two, twice the, uh, the, uh, the radius of, of Jupiter, we're actually looking for a dip in brightness of the order of two to three percent. Um, the micro observatory wasn't actually uh, designed for uh, observing exoplanets. Um, it hasn't, it's only, the only calibration files that are available are dark field, there are no flats and, and no bias images available. Um, the telescope's been operating almost continually since 2009 and, and by mid last year, the optics were getting quite dusty uh, before a major service. And you can see at the top of the, um, the top of the, the right hand panel, the dust motes uh, that, that were, uh, were, were present before the service. Um, the tracking is purely software controlled. And as a result, there is significant drifting of the target uh, across the plate. And that's the, the, the second graph on the, on the right hand side. You can see it's probably moving uh, in the, the, the Y axis. Um, which is 500 pixels, it's moving around about 150 pixels over the course of a, of a four hour ob, uh, observation set. Um, combine that with the, uh, the dust map, that motion across the, 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 the sensor with the, the dust motes that are present and you've got noisy photometry. So uh, unfortunately this isn't going to give you super duper uh, very precise uh, transit curves that, that you may see in, in, in textbooks. It, it's noisy, noisy, noisy data. Um, weather out in Arizona can be a problem, especially when, you, when you're looking perhaps for a, a four hour observation run, um, and particularly so during the monsoon season. And, and here's a, a, a nice snap of some lightning that was captured on one of the Micro observatory images in uh, 2009 August last year. Um, you may remember, I, 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 you may not have noticed, I drew attention to the fact that there are the, 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 net, the telescopes are connected uh, by wires, and one of the other problems is rodents. And the rodents do occasionally chew through the cables. Uh, here's a, it's a, a I believe it's the, the bushy-tailed wood rat is one of the, the culprits uh, and they do uh, chew through the cables and, and can take the, 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 uh, the telescopes offline and that requires somebody to actually go out there uh, from the Whipple Observatory and, and, and patch up the, uh, the cables. That said, um, the, uh, the micro-observatory looks at a suite of 30 hot Jupiter exoplanets that are observed over the course of the year, but they're listed on the, the right-hand side, right-hand panel. Um, the stars are, are magnitudes quite bright, 10.3 to 12.1. The, the periods uh, range from 0.4 to 4.1 days. Some, some transits are quite short, 69 minutes. Some can be quite long, 226 minutes. And the depth is 0 0.015 to 0.04 magnitude. So that's, so that's yeah, 0.015 on a 12.1 mag star is quite a challenge. Um, the, the grid below uh, at the bottom of the, the left-hand uh, panel um, shows, of course, not every planet is observable every night, every month of the year, because depending on the, on the, uh, the, the position in the sky. And so, but you can see that in green, I've highlighted the, the observation seasons when, when the, the planets are uh, observable and they, the planets have been, the targets have been chosen to, to cover uh, all of the year. Um, 
although there are gaps. Um, to fill those gaps, new targets are being reviewed and added to fill the holes. So that 30 uh, suite of 30 targets does will be increasing over time. Um, the key thing about these is that these are new observations. This is not archival material that, that's being that you can analyze. It's new observations. So if we have a look on the, the right hand side, we can see that Thursday night, tonight, the 26th, um, the telescope set to observe WASP 43 and, and TRES 2 throughout the night. Um, the forecast tonight isn't particularly brilliant. It looks as though it's going to be a little bit cloudy first thing in the, uh, in the night and towards morning, but there may be a chance to actually um, catch um, those two, some of those targets if, if we're lucky. Um, the way you actually um, request the target is, is, is to be uh, observed is very straightforward. You just click on the, um, the little icon that says observe uh, and then you that will then set in train um, a process by which all of the, um, the images that are collected will be put into your uh, work area on the, the DIY website and they're delivered in inverted commas to you the following day or the day after. It, it does take a little bit of time for, for the, uh, the, the website to, to update itself. Um, so once you've collected those, um, those uh, oh yeah, sorry, I, I just missed a little bit. Um, for a, a for a target around about 80 to 100 unfiltered images are, are taken every night um, the cadence is three minutes and they they usually cover about an hour before the transit plus an hour on after the transit has taken place um, there's the, the the site provide, provides a rudimentary uh, online photometry tool so you can measure the brightness of the host star and then you can compare those with others, the, the, the findings of others in DIY. So there's a little bit of a, a community spirit to, to the website as well. Um, here's an example of uh, the, well, here's the online photometry tool with um, an image of WASP 43 that was, of, here's the, um, the, the, the online uh, photometry tool and, and it's, as I was saying, it's, it's an image of uh, the WASP-43 uh, star field uh, taken almost, um, almost exactly two years ago, actually. Um, and it's just an example that, 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 that I use. Um, to help, I'll zoom in on, on the target and, and you'll see that um, there's a number of uh, Colored circles, and, and the way you actually um, do the photometry is, is, is very straightforward. Um, first, you um, well, one of the things is that you you're provided with a, a finder chart, so you can actually identify which is the uh, the target uh, that, that you're looking at, and there are suggestions on the comparison stars to use. So the first thing you you have to do is to calibrate. Uh, by uh, dark subtracting the the the, 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 um, the calibration file, um, you then um, move the, the 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 little circle that appears where your mouse is over the target, and once you are happy that uh, that you've captured all of the the light or all the the white from uh, the uh, the target you, you press uh, press your mouse button that moves you on to give you a, a blue circle that you then use over sorry a, a green circle that, that you then stick over the comparison stars and click and click uh, and then um, it needs uh, an indication of how bright the background is uh, so you pick a couple of uh, locations usually around the target 
uh, and click on those and you'll see uh, on the left hand side that it gives you the um, the, the, the um, ADU count essentially for the uh, each of those little annually um, and then you do calculate and record and what it does it will calculate the the relative brightness based on those uh, five uh, numbers um, you can repeat it if you're not happy that, that you've, you've, you've made a mistake or, or whatever um, and you just keep on working your way through so with a with a hundred um, hundred images it probably takes my estimate it probably takes a good minute to do each one so you're probably talking about 100 minutes maybe you, know, you get a bit bored uh, it probably takes about two hours to work through a complete data set which, which is quite slow but at the end of that what you end up with is a, a graph as, as shown on the, the right hand side of, of, the, of the slide which shows the, uh, the relative brightness. Um, it also indicates when the predicted transit was, was when it was predicted to occur. And you can see it in, in this case that there is actually a distinct dip as the, um, as the transit progresses and then it returns to baseline. As I mentioned, uh, one of the problems is that it's noisy, and as you can see, that that's quite a noisy, uh, noisy graph. Um, so, so I, I, did, I did that for a few times, and then I thought, hmm, there must be an easier way to do this. And so, what I developed was a, a, an offline uh, pipeline called Meow. Uh, the micro observatory exoplanet observation workflow and this was because that online photometry is so labor intensive the fits images can actually be downloaded from the micro observatory image archive um, there's quite a lot of mouse clicks involved in downloading those repetitive mouse clicks but after about 20 minutes of mouse clicking you can get a whole data set of uh, 100 images on your hard drive so what i've done over did over the, the past three years was develop the the pipeline for a, a semi-automated reduction and analysis of the images it showed on the right hand side um, what i do is i i, I use a package called muniwin which is a, a freeware um photometry package um, to do the to do the photometry i use dark fields um, and also i've developed i i, I produce some uh, pseudo flat fields to try and uh, reduce the effect of those dust motes uh, on, on the noise I, I use these by picking a fortuitously there are because it's it's taking images every night there will be some images that are taken when the, the, the it's cloudy there's maybe uh, the, the, the background light is just about right that you can actually use to produce a, a, a pseudo flat field um, i ingest those into uh, muniwin um, from which I, I get text files of the the julian date the magnitude and error which which i then uh, export and, and or, or export as text files import into the uh, the exoplanet transit database this is a uh, a website operated by the czech astronomical society and it allows you to do a very quick transit fit to uh, your data you, you just put the data in specify which planet you're uh, observing and it will, will will fit a transit so that's my first look to see whether actually have i got a decent transit uh, to analyze um, i then move on to my uh, higher fidelity analysis using the um the model uh, or a model called exofast which is a, a transit fitting model that's hosted on the nasa exoplanet archive website uh, this is a professional model it's the ones that the pros use 
Um, and but in order to do that, you've got to do some uh, manipulation of, of the uh, the data that's going to in, into it. You've got to convert um, the magnitudes into relative fluxes, which is quite straightforward. You've got to convert the Julian date to the barycentric Julian date, and there is an online uh, utility that you can uh, use that. Um, need to do a bit of uh, linear detrending of the flux uh, because uh, exafast really doesn't like uh, data that perhaps starts with a flux of, of one and, and ends with a, at the end of the transit with a flux of 1.2. So you've got to put some linear detrending. You've got to combine that with um, the air mass. Uh, which uh, you can get from MuniWin, put that, the, 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 the BJD, the flux, the air of the air mass into Exafast and comes out and you, and you get um, the results. And I'll show you what comes out uh, on the next slide. I use a, a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet to bind the workflow together uh, and store the results. Uh, and as I say, I use text files to transfer data to from the transit models. Um, it's quite a labor intensive um, process, probably takes around about an hour and a half of cutting, pasting, mouse clicking and everything. Um, and maybe about 10 minutes of, of computer time on a server at Pasadena to run Exafast. Uh, but it's an improvement over um, the, uh, the online photometry. And to show you what I did, I, I, I did the, the WAS 43 um, observation that, that, I, that I worked through on the online um, photometry, and that's on the right hand side. And on the left hand side is my, my fit using Exafast to the, the, the data that I've, that I've downloaded. It's noisy again, of course, but, but the transit can be seen, and it, it is, yes, it is more efficient the manual online photometry and you do get a lot more data out. Um, here's a, a few examples uh, of, of light curves that, that I've obtained using uh, micro observatory and um, you can see that there's in, in the table on the right hand side uh, that there's a good agreement between what uh, the, uh, the micro observatory and Exafast derive the parameters for the transit duration and the, the planet radius uh, with that in the, the NASA exoplanet archive. Um, so this is, having done this, I'm, I, was, I was pretty happy that I, I got a reasonable um, pipeline to, to analyze um, transits with. What I did, what I have done is, is looked at a a particular star, I, I just chose it, uh, HAT P32b. It's, uh, uh, or B is that the planet is, is the B. Um, it's a, a 1.75 um, Jupiter radius, hot Jupiter, um, orbiting 11.3 mag star every 2.15 days. Um, I was provided with access to 43 transits between uh, 2013 and 2020, which I reduced and analyzed with my uh, NEO pipeline. I modeled them using Exafast. Um, and then I, what I did, and it's the graph that's on the right hand side, which is a graph of the um, observed mid transit time. Uh, minus the computed transit time based on the most recent ephemeris for the system, which is a paper by Wang et al. in 2019. And so um, you'll see that the, the graph is the difference between the observed and the computed um, time on the, the y-axis. On the x-axis, there's the, the, the epoch, so based on the ephemeris of, of Wang et al. Uh, and you can see in the, the histogram on the right-hand side of, of, of that panel, 
that the um, that the the, um, the root mean square error of those observations is of the order of 2.99 minutes, which is coincidentally the uh, the cadence of the of the uh, the nominal cadence of the uh, observation. So it looks as though we can using uh, micro observatory you can uh, observe um, an exoplanet and determine its transit uh, mid transit time to within plus or minus three well plus or minus uh, three minutes or so um, I compared the, the, the transit durations, the transit depths with, with that in the, uh, in, 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 uh, on the Exoplanet Archive catalog. And you'll see that I estimate the duration of 192 minutes plus or minus 11 compared with 187 plus or minus uh, three quarters of a minute. So yeah, it's, it's not as accurate, but it's in the same ballpark. And likewise, my, my estimate of the transit depth is similar to that in, in the catalog. So it's looking good. One of the things you can do with Exafast is you, you can run multiple transits at the same time. So transits that were observed over the course of uh, several years, you can put the data in and using the, the, the Marco Chain Monte Carlo fit that comes with Exafast, you can fit, and I think you can fit the, um, the transit curve, which is shown in red in, in the, the left-hand panel. And I think you'll agree that's, that's quite a convincing transit, uh, or set of transits that, that are shown there. Um, Exafast gives you uh, oodles of uh, parameters from the model, um, which are listed on, on, on the right-hand side. You, you, probably can't, you don't need to read them. Um, this will be. This is being written up, uh, or there's a paper that I'm almost completed that, I, that will be hopefully coming out at some point. And the, the median values for the, the stellar, the, the planetary, and the transit parameters are consistent, broadly consistent with those in the, the exoplanet archive. So this looks like it's a good uh, tool to use to um, uh, analyze exoplanet transits uh, using that small six inch robotic telescope out in Arizona. I just have a sip of water. Um, the world changed me a little bit um, last year um, when I got involved with uh, an initiative that, that's come out of um, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at uh, Pasadena. Um, and one of the concerns that both NASA and the European Space Agency have is that um, the TESS satellite which, which was launched uh, last year, is predicted to discover over 10,000 transiting exoplanets. But some of them are only going to be observed for around about 27 days. And the mid-transit times for exoplanets with periods greater than 27 days may become stale by the time they're, they're observed by future, uh, future space-based telescopes such as the James Webb um, Telescope and, and the Aerial, the ESA Aerial Mission. Um, an example, uh, there's a graph at the bottom right hand side uh, of, the, of the slide, uh, and it shows that a representative test planet could have an uncertainty in its mid-transit of around about 47 minutes after one year after it was first observed, and 3.9 hours after five years. So this is, would make observing with a satellite particularly uh, uh, challenging because you would have to, if you only know that the transit's going to uh, take place somewhere between over a period of 3.9 hours, you're going to have to spend an awful lot of uh, satellite time observing it. 
uh, to, to be able to see the, the transit. So what's needed is some means by which to actually improve the ephemeris of the, uh, these newly discovered and already discovered um, uh, exoplanets. Um, so what was proposed was as part of the, 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 the big um, Astro 2020 decadal study survey that takes place uh, every 10 years over in the States to direct uh, essentially what NASA should be researching. A paper uh, was proposed that the creation of a, a community-wide program to maintain these uh, precise mid-transit times for exoplanet targets and it's called Exoplanet Watch. Um, there's a paper, there's a, a link to a, an archive, uh, a, a paper on, on an archive that, that actually describes uh, what this is all about. Um, so I've, I've been involved from around about, I think it was around about June or so last year with this program. Um, it's a, it's a citizen science activity. It's complementary to us that there's another um, uh, program, the test follow-up observing program, which, which, which aims to eliminate or eliminate uh, false positives from tests and confirm planetary systems. But to participate in that, you've got to be a super duper uh, observer with, with high credentials. The requirements for Exoplanet Watch are, are far less strict, are, are less stringent, which means that anybody who can observe an exoplanet uh, either remotely, robotically using a micro observatory or their own their own kit can actually participate. There's a parallel activity um, on the, on our side of, of the Atlantic um, called the the Aerial Exoclock. Project, which is which is doing the same thing, and and Exoplanet Watch and Exoclock do not are not competing; they are collaborating uh, together. So that, that's that's a good uh, a good plus there. Um, I've got yeah components of the ETS. Uh, it used to be called the Exoplanet Transit Survey before it became Exoplanet Watch. I missed that to change that. But it's got three components. One is to identify targets for amateurs to, to observe. So these are priority targets that, that need to be observed. Um, there's a, a, a reduction pipeline called Exotic, the Exoplanet Transit Interpretation Code, uh, which was developed by a, a young uh, student intern at JPL over the summer. Um, and there's a uh, a database, the results of which from Exotic uh, is uploaded into the AAVSO uh, Exoplanet um, database, uh, and that will then be, those data will be used to improve the ephemeris of, of, the, of the various targets. It's still re relatively early days with Exoplanet Watch. It hasn't gone live uh, yet. It's, it's planned to do so later uh, in the uh, this year, probably in the summer. Um, but what it does do is that it provides an opportunity for, for amateurs to contribute directly to exoplanet research. Um, an example on the right hand side, I've got a, uh, an example of a, tra of a transit of, of the planet Tres 1b. Um, this has been the, the graph and the, the data that the exotic actually produces. And in the, in the uh, panel below that, I've done a comparison between uh, the ver various other ways of, of, of um, measuring the mid-transit time for, for that target. There's my MIAO level one, which is the exoplanet transit database I mentioned earlier. There's uh, level two and three, which is using different uh, exafast in two different um, modes and then exotic and all of them are within the error bars of the, uh, the transit. Um, exotic takes for a, for a hundred observations 
probably takes around about uh, an hour and a quarter to run, um, either on, 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 your, on your machine, it can be a, a Windows laptop or, or an Apple Mac um, or any Unix system, as a, a Linux system as well. Um, but importantly, after the first minute or so, when you set up all the parameters, the computer's doing all the work. So not only is it faster than my Meow uh, pipeline, it's actually uh, a lot easier and, and less work for, for me to do. I can get on and, and look at other things while, uh, while that's running. So this is, um, as I say, this is a good, uh, it was a fantastic uh, program and you, you don't need to, well, Anybody who can observe, uh, and certainly the the um, exoplanet section of the uh, of the BAA is is actually supporting this type of activity, although directed more towards the the exo exo clock project. Um, I suppose you could ask the question: Why am I not? Supporting exoclock. Well, I am doing um, some of the uh, the uh, observations that I've made with my Mio um, pipeline. I, I've uploaded to exoclock, uh, but because the uh, the telescopes are on the uh, the U.S. side of the the Atlantic, uh, once exoplanet watches up and running, I'll probably be more concentrating on supporting that than the uh, than the exoclock project. Okay, um, we're coming towards the end now, I could be pleased to know. So it's not just exo exoplanets. Um, one of the, the things is that the, the, the DIY exoplanet star fields, you remember about a degree by three quarters of a degree in size, they're observing a particular patch of sky for three to four hours with images every three minutes. So what there is, there's, a, there's the potential for serendipitous observation of short period variables. And it just so happened to be that on the HAP P32B um, star field, um, there is, I discovered a previously unreported short period variable. It's up at the, the, the top in red, at the, at the top of the, uh, of the image on the right, marked V. Uh, hat P is, is more towards the center of, of the image. It's a 13.9 V mag star. Um, when I took all the, the observations, so this was, um, I think it was 19 uh, epochs of observations. Uh, I, and I, I came up with a, pushed it through Paranso, work out what the period was, and I got a period of about 1.72 hours, an amplitude of 0.2 magnitude, and there's nothing on the VSX, the Variable Star uh, Database within AFSO. Uh, from its characteristics, it is probably a pulsating variable, of the Delta Scuti type, uh, and stars with short period variability I've seen on other star fields as well. So there's an awful lot of work to do with the data, not just looking at the exoplanet transit, but also looking for other uh, variables within the, the star field. Um, if you want to read up a little bit more about exoplanets, uh, I've, I've highlighted three books here. The, fir the first two on the left-hand side are very general, in introductions that I've read them they're good books uh, and a good and very recent uh, 2017 I think uh, was, was one and I got one for Christmas the middle one for Christmas so that's quite new and then if you really want to get into power uh, reading about exoplanets I can thoroughly recommend uh, Perriman's The Exoplanet Handbook quite a bit more expensive than the other two uh, but that, that's where you will find everything uh, that you need to know about exoplanets. Um, so that's it. So just a few acknowledgements at, at the end. 
uh, from the team at the Center for Astrophysics at JPL, the sponsors of the micro observatory, the data sources I've used, and then I've been asked to put in a link saying that uh, the planet search, the micro observatory, and exoplanet watch that's supported is part of NASA's University of, Universe of Learning and it's supported by the, uh, the NASA award that's shown below. And that completes my whistle stop tour through observing exoplanets with the micro observatory. Any questions? Okay. Thank you, Martin. Uh, would you mind any questions uh, if we? Yeah, I'll try. Okay, so what I'm going to do is if you can, if ever, everyone can see in the participants window, you should have a way to raise your hand or you can put a question in the chat, uh, whatever you feel more comfortable with and, and I'll unmute the mic and um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep the, I'll keep my screen up so in case we want to go back yeah. and um, look at some of the slides, but all right, hopefully, oh, why is that not working? Nope. Heard okay, right. Any questions? Does anyone not have? Oh, there we go. Derek. Derek, go ahead. Hi, yeah. Um, you mentioned that one of the parameters you put into your software was air mass. Could you ex um, expand on that, please? Yeah, that, that's the essentially the, um, the, the the thickness of the the air that the um, that the telescopes looking through as the uh, ob observations continue. Um, so over four hours, you can see the um, elevation of the, the scope can vary from perhaps 75 degrees down to uh, 30 degrees ab above the horizon. And of course, the lower the elevation, uh, the greater the thickness of the air, which will have an impact on the uh, on the um, light that's coming through from the star and, and the photometry. So that is what I, I put that into Exafast because in addition to the, the, the rough um, linear D trend, which gets it more or less uh, a straight baseline outside of the transit, the air mass can actually um, add, a, add another D trend parameter. And, and actually on exotic, that is the, the main D-trend parameter that's used to, to, to get a, a good um, light curve out at the end. Okay. Um, and we have one more from Richard. Um, how did you find the variable star on the star field? How do you find it? Yeah. Um, there's a, um, I've got, well, one is that with all of the micro observatory targets, you get a finder chart. Um, if I stop sharing, can I find one? Uh, yeah, why? No, I don't want to know about that. Forget about that. Um, how do I? I'm going to try and find one. It's not as easy as that. But there, there are finder charts available that, that identifies the um, the target let's have a look here anyway, happy 10 it's a little bit slow and then I probably have to uh, zoom. I'm going to share my screen and then I share that one and do that. Here we go. So, so this is a, a PDF that, that you that's provided, and it will show you that in this case it's HAP P10, so it's it's the yellow circle, and then the two compare the, or the, the good comparison stars, which are of a similar magnitude, relatively nearby. Uh, and hopefully of a similar color to the uh, the, the target star uh, provided. So you just um, you use that to, to visually identify the um, the, the target. Okay. That help. I can I can show you how I do it on on Muni when if you want. Uh, why 
time. So I just do share. I share my whole screen. You'll get to see all of the lovely. Hi, Martin. Yep. It's, it's Alan the Rain here. Just, just yep. wondering, do you, on your when you're looking at sort of potential variables, do you do you sort of blink the screens at all to, to try and find any additional ones, or is it purely? Um, I'm, I'm using. I use to, to find the variables. I'm I'm using what's if I can just sort myself out, right? Uh, I, why is he doing that? Okay. Um, within uh, MuniWin, there is a find variables um, button that allows you to, the easiest ways, uh, what's that doing that? Oh, because, there we go, there we go. I can't find Muni when, but the, there is a um, find projects. Let's find a, when was the one? Hang on. Just bear with me. Uh, at P32, you'll see I've got quite a number of. Um, I've got short period variable. Here we go. This is this is not the best. Um, but there is a, I don't think this is one of the best actually. There, there is a plot that MuniWin produces that will actually show you across the, um, across the image, it's a plot of magnitude versus the standard deviation. And the idea is if you've got uh, points above this what should be a, a, a normal curve you've, you've possibly got a variable and I uh, no I can't find it it's not, but you can you can see how in the example that I've shown there is a general decrease in the in the brightness of, of that star um, yeah so that's what I'm using to uh, at least initially identify um, the variables. Do you, do you get do you get problems with hot pixels at all or not? Um, uh, well, I dark subtract them. Um, the, the main problem I get is is with with saturated. Some of these, uh, as you'll see, are are quite saturated. Perhaps this one is, is quite um, saturated, and the streaking. There's there's lots of problems, but but the the hot pixels are are, are solved using the the darks that are taken every night. I should have a, I should be able to find a better one than this, but um, I haven't got one. Yeah, I should be, I should have thought about that one. That question. Um, and I uh, said so, yeah. So going back to how do I identify it? Well. It, how do I identify it on the, let's have a look. I can't remember. I just happen to know that this is the, um, the variable because I've, I've, I've memorized the star field and I think that's one of them, that's what. Uh, Martin, can, I, can, we, can I just ask a question on behalf of um, someone? Yep. Um, how do you distinguish between variable star and exoplanet? Um, well, the ver well, the variable star is how would you do that? Um, well, the, the, the exoplanet is going to have a, a periodic uh, variation in brightness, much as as the um, as a uh, a variable star. So an eclipsing binary will also do that. Um, off the top of my head, I'm not too sure because I don't actually do it, but but there are ways that you can tell from the characteristics and I've, it's, I've forgotten at present how to do it, but you can uh, do. Maybe, uh, maybe Pat over in the States can, can help out here. Nope. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll partially answer. I know I answered the question on behalf or asked the question on behalf of someone. Uh, I, I presume that it, it becomes, they are potentially one could masquerade as another it's just that you have to look at that in different ways and and it's perhaps yeah. a more yeah. advanced thing to actually distinguish between the two of them 
That's right, and, and you, you'll never, the, the, a, an exoplanet will never be confirmed purely on, on its transit. Um, so that's why it takes so long to actually confirm them, but they'll need some, uh, the radial velocity uh, work will need to be done, uh, which will, will help identify that. that. That has come back with the shape of the curve. Yeah, yeah, there's the shape of the curve, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Yep. I've unmuted you as well, Pat, if you wanted to speak to the other. So it's Bob here. So thank you, Martin, for a fascinating and excellent talk. Um, I don't know if we have any, any more questions, but I'm sure that uh, it'll spark a lot of interest in a lot of members to uh, perhaps have a go. Citizen science seems to be a very popular thing as does in some respects the serendipitous uh, observations as we um, we heard the other week with uh, Dave Boddington imaging the Lunar X. So uh, just to yeah. encourage people to get out there and uh, observe. And yeah, if anybody help. needs any help, then just, um, yep, give me a, get in contact. Yep. Okay, what, what has been suggested by somebody private me privately on the group is that we could perhaps put together some sort of um, some sort of either fact sheet or whatever with some of these details so we can share that um, with with the members and and perhaps to a wider audience to to enable other people to do a similar sort of type of thing sort of under, under perhaps under your guidance uh, martin so yeah that's there's there's quite a bit on the um on roger dimmock's page on the baa um, Exoplanets website as well, which has got some useful uh, information. But very happy to help. Yep. Right. If I if I can, uh, so obviously it's Alan Lorraine here. But I, if I can say, Martin, thank you very much indeed for sort of uh, a talking to us and uh, and perhaps uh, and bearing with us in our sort of our trial obviously the, uh, the current circumstances made it, made it difficult for you to come up to Basingstoke uh, in in person but uh, thank you for your efforts on that and i hope that everybody has in, enjoyed this and uh, and hopefully we can share it of uh, the recording to other people as well so uh, thank you very much indeed martin and, yeah. and perhaps if we can i know we we broke at eight o'clock for for the uh, the applause but perhaps if we can have a little bit of a